practice. So the work is an album. It's also a film. It can be viewed at home or in a theater. It is a uh, multimedia performance piece that can be expanded and contracted in a, in, um, and by that I mean it can be a staged theatrical work where we have um, motion and a rig rigged lighting and projection, or it can be uh, broken down into a smaller, more chamber music-y type offering. Um, and then we have plans for the future for it to become uh, an installation where uh, or a public art piece. And so that doesn't exist yet, um, but by shape shifting, we we call it also a Rubik's cube, Rubik's cube art, where you can kind of any venue can take what we have to offer and and twist it into whatever medium that they can offer to their communities. And the hope is that we um, a find out what creates the most engagement, what version um, gets the most excitement within this project, and then also just to see how we can uh, use collaborative arts to build a new face of what it might mean for the public to engage with contemporary music. I love that. And there's there's so many deep, rich parts to it. Um, I'm going to pause this just for a second and ask Neil to maybe do a little troubleshooting on the back end. It seems like our YouTube stream isn't working. Facebook is going, which is great. Okay. So hello to Facebook people. Um, we're going to take a moment here and try to troubleshoot the YouTube stream. Not really sure what's going on with this. I'm going to poke around for just a moment and, and see what we've got happening. Um, apologies for the delay, everyone. Yeah, all the things are theoretically working correctly, just not functionally. <clears throat> okay, now it's up. Great. There's Gene. Hey, Gene, can you wave? And then we'll just see where we are in the stream. Okay. Great. And that's it's about an 18 second delay. So we're <laughs> fine. So now we're up on YouTube, which is great. It's ro it's rolling. It's rocking. Um, so we were just talking about the idea of a shape shifting art project. YouTube viewers later, you've missed a wonderful long discussion of how shape shifting art can exist in inviting people from all different walks of life and spaces into a multimodal artistic experience, whether that's as a theater piece, a film to be watched from home or in a theater. Um, as an album that you can listen to, as an art installation that can exist in permanence uh, in a space. So many different ways to experience this art project, which again is called Descended. So now let's um, let's dive into that. I'm going to join you uh, while we chat on the spotlight. Um, so now we can be here for everyone to see. And um, to get into this, let, let's talk about like what Descended actually is. So Descended is a project inspired by the writings and thought pieces of Lafcadio Hearn, who has a special relation to our fabulous guest, Jean. Um, Jean, can you talk a little bit about Lafcadio Hearn and, and sort of the inspiration of this project? Sure. Yeah, he is my great, great uncle, but is, I mean, was. He died in 1905. He lived in the um, late 19th century, and he's most well remembered for his um, Japanese ghost and folk story transcriptions, but he was so multifaceted and there's an amazing article written by Jonathan D. Um, in the New Yorker that describes how many par moving parts he had to him. Um, and something that really interested me in him was his how topical what he wrote about is today. Um, there's the the folk ghost stories and his discovery of not discovery his uh, obsession with the fear experience and how it can be seen as a beautiful thing, but there is also a journalist side to him. He lived all over the United States, in Europe, in Japan, in the West Indies, and he was so interested in documenting underrepresented cultures and advocating for them um, as he saw injustices happening globally, especially as the Western world was developing on very fast and large scales. And so he's this really interesting man who was a writer and he's a novelist and a journalist, but most remembered for his documentations of marginalized spirit worlds. And it's, it's amazing reading some of the pieces. Um, his writing style is super distinct. It, it reminds me a little bit of like thinking of the, the turn of the century and, and sort of the, the authors who are exploring like short fiction in that realm. So 
Poe was about 100 years earlier, 75 years earlier. But there's definitely like a common spirit in their voice and the language that they use and the way that they have these beautifully floral descriptions of fascinatingly spoopy work. Um, it just draws you in in this really in, in, enticing way. Um, we've got the New Yorker, New Yorker article, we'll throw that in chat. Um, also feels cool kind of talking about this idea of marginalized communities, how present it feels, and it really drives through the work. I think that's something that's really special about this album and this whole project is that it feels very much of the moment, but also timeless. And I think it's a real triumph. Um, so Maria Finkelmeyer, a dear friend of mine in Fourth Walls, um, composed most of the work on the on the track and um, it plays on the album. Uh, she couldn't join us today, but then it became this really cool collaborative project, which started its life as a, as a theatrical piece um, done here in the Boston area at the Harvard Art Lab. And we have a bit of a clip. It was originally a, a collaborative thing with Masari Studios, another wonderful sound and light installation company in the greater Boston area. Um, so we've got a little clip of that early, the first showing of the theatrical experience. We'll show a couple segments of it. Gene, do you want to say anything before I just drop in some video? No, just All right. enjoy. Here we go. leave more for the imagination when we get to bring the piece out into the real world soon. Um, speaking of which, that was done in late 2019. And as all of us know, things changed shortly thereafter in the world. So it had grand plans for touring, being a theatrical production, further development. Um, and then everything had to shift and Descended found new life as this incredible art film, which has had showings and won some great awards internationally at various film festivals. Um, Jean, I would love for you to talk a little bit about the process of, of transitioning from knowing that this was a shape-shifting art project from the beginning, but going from a theatrical expression into the, the film world, um, how that all felt, what was it like? And how, like, as a musician, have you done stuff in film before? No, <laughs> no, um, it was an incredible transition and it was um, the first major transition of the piece which was, uh, you know, fortified by the pandemic. And so originally we had wanted to make a visual album of the performance art piece. So originally they were going to be more like sister projects uh, in the sense that it was a, a sidestep to into a digital version of what was already existing in the theatrical version. But there were a lot of complications with that, even without the pandemic. Um, 
one being, you know, I was really wanting to emulate Childish Gambino and Beyonce and uh, even Billie Eilish and, and their really artistic storytelling projects that are multimedia digital visual albums. Um, but there's the, there's part of, part of it is the expense. The other part of it is the need to create a bunch of separate music videos and then somehow seam them together. Um, and the other big part of it was the pandemic uh, put closed down a lot of the studios that we could have done that inside of. And so we just, for a variety of reasons, ended up morphing it into a film. And we worked with 410 Media, who had their own very interesting and exciting ideas for the the visual narrative and how that would unfold. And so um, it there was a stepping stone process of the change from a visual album into an actual experimental art film. Um, and and it, none of it was planned out. It was more of a series of happy accidents that occurred, one being the pandemic, the other being some natural hurdles built into the idea of a visual album, and then the other being new collaborators, new ideas. How do you edit, uh, undo, redo, visions that you might have when you have new people who are coming with their own perspectives. I love that talk of the collaborative process of like iterative work, iterations, but then also just understand that, yeah, it can all be scrapped and changed. It's so cool to see it shift. And something that I, I really am excited about, about this whole project is that it's not one thing. It is so many different expressions that all have the same roots. It's almost like when we hear about forests being connected by the the mycological underground things that connect the trees to trees and this whole huge mushroom root system that exists in the world that's there in Lafcadio O'Hearn's stories and his biography um, and yet each of these beautiful trees of the project the live piece the film the album is so distinct in its own way um, I also want to give a shout out 410 Media I know them well from doing a lot of like new music art videos and they're sort of like music videos with contemporary music composition that are beautifully done really cleverly edited and i'm just kind of ignorant to the rest of their work but like this is the first big narrative piece i've seen from them and it's so stunning um so i kind of want to kick it off we, we've got a few clips from the art film we'll have a link to the full thing um also in chat i encourage everyone to watch it it's won some big awards for like best music best new film uh, things of the month at film festivals in Toronto, across the States, some stuff in Europe. Yeah, right? yeah, lots in Europe. There is so many laurels. Just like if you look at the poster, it's just it looks like a set of Grecian emperor or Roman emperors with just like laurels and stars and awards all over the place. Uh, it's it's super exciting. So um, I kind of want to show something that's a little bit of a soft intro. And I think we're going to show just a very pretty part of it first. Uh, and this is going to be Muses, Gene, just so you know what we're getting into first, because I think it's a little bit of a, a different way. And then I want to talk about um, the character of the film and the interesting way that that evolved. So here's a beautiful first couple images from the film, just so you can get a little bit of the, the storytelling visual language, and then we'll, we'll dig into some other content from it. I know that seems like the end of the film and it's spoilers. It's it's not. It's okay. It's it's a multifaceted work. <laughs> You're not seeing just like, oh, there's that moment with the tiny box. I know how it ends. That's the rosebud moment. It's not. Um, <laughs> but I think I, I just love playing that clip because it's so visually striking. It shows the breadth of the film that like there are other actors, there are characters, there's work, there's nature involved. And that was filmed at Walden Pond, right? Out here in Massachusetts. Yeah. yeah. 
Uh, no, it was actually filmed um, in uh, New Jersey. Oh, that, that was particular. the New Jersey set. Okay. Yes, I forget the name of the of the little pond slash lake, but it was filmed just over the border of Philly. Aha! Great. Yeah. So this project has spanned the country from where where Jean is in Wisconsin. Uh, we recorded the album in our recording artist John Escobar's house last August in Watertown here. That was a whole trip. We'll talk about that in a moment. Y'all filmed some stuff up here. You filmed stuff in New Jersey. You had a giant pool. Um, <laughs> so there's there's some really cool work in this album coming through. The thing that I think is really interesting, thinking about the narrative of the film, digging into Lefkady O'Hearn's love of the paranormal and the ghost story world and drawn from these marginalized communities, is how sort of the genre feel of the film came, came about. So how, what would you describe like the short film? If you were to, if you had to put it in a genre box, where would you stick it? Ooh. Um, so what we have thrown around the idea of it being an art house horror, because it is a transition film about the otherworldly and the post life experience if you want to interpret it that way. I, guess. And I think, that's I think there's some really strong visual stuff with that. So let's, let's just jump right now. I'm going to share Mugina now. Um, Cause that starts to bring in that flavor. That is the wrong thing to have shared. It is this one that I need to click. There we go. <laughs> It's so exciting and it's so fun to play and explore. Um, Jean, what's your what's your background in like theater or dance? Do you have much? Um, I wanted to major in theater. I was in lots of theater-esque um, programs in high school and then that oozed a little bit into college. I did do a dance program in Europe where we toured with um, six professional musicians and then two professional dancers and the musicians had to go through pretty intensive uh, contemporary dance training. So I, I'm not a dancer, nor am I an actress, but I have, you know, um, built some of those skills over a long period of time in small ways. Yeah, that's that's our jam in the fourth wall is finding ways to integrate different disciplines, going into that hybrid arts realm. What was that thing in Europe called? I'm, I'm totally curious about that. It was called Diva Mania, okay. and it was about uh, the Andy Warhol prediction that everybody was going to receive 15 minutes of fame, which ended up coming true. Nice. Yeah. Oh, that's so neat. What a, what a cool project. Um, I, and I love how all, so much of that comes to bear in this film. Like, you are straight up the star of the film. And it's, it's really neat seeing how as performers we can take what we know and transition into so many different realms um what was the directorial process like for you in that did you have a hand was at 410 doing a lot of the directing did you have a director yeah so i co-directed it with 410 media and they really were the visual narrative directors you know they created the vis the visual of the moon and then the process of me um experiencing the moon, which is a big sort of crux of the film. And then my directorship was more like big picture visionary. This is what I want the outcome goal of the project to be. And uh, I had everything to do with the Lovecadio Hearn references, which are peppered. I mean, there are dozens of Lovecadio Hearn 
moments and references dotted and speckled throughout the entire film. And so there's really two ways to watch the film. There's like the more abstract art experience of what is this transition about and what does it mean to me? But then there's also, if you're a Lafcadio Hearn reader and you know his content, you'll see threads and themes and symbols from his work. And it's that's what I loved about the Childish Gambino, This is America, like learning and finding those symbols and then having that be its own tangent and, and trying to figure out what it means in the context of the film. And so I was really about that symbolism as well as the big picture. Um, and they were more of the, the, the visual visionary um, builders. That's super cool. And just being able to find inspiration in, in what some really brilliant artists are doing in, in popular music right now. Like you mentioned Queen Bee and um, yeah, Childish Gambino stuff. And there, there's such an interesting precedent that's coming from popular music and the hip hop rap side of the world that is like teaching us in contemporary art music where we need to be and how we need to step up. I think of like Kendrick Lamar's albums and just creating these extraordinary operatic narratives that run through the work. And then like the visual language of these these visual albums coming out from Beyonce and Childish Gambino and the like. Um, it's so cool seeing and get, seeing how, how you're playing with that and, and being inspired by it and then and putting your own spin and voice on it. So I think I'd like to show the Descended trailer just to give people the full teaser. It touches on more of that visual language that 410 brought to the table. And then um, as, we, as we play the trailer, we'll put the link to the full film on Gene's website uh, up in the chats. So I encourage everyone to, to seriously watch it. It's fabulous. And um, here's the trailer just to give you a little teaser. One of the other really cool things you mentioned when we were talking about the beginning of this project is uh, normalizing shape-shifting art projects within university conservatory context. So we saw the little plug there at the end for the University of Wisconsin Office of the Chancellor that funded this project, gave great grant funding to make all this happen. Um, as, as the fourth wall, we do a fair amount of university work and we love trying to bring departments together and bring different ideas together. And it's so exciting to see that you are, you are pushing the same thing in your institutions and further in more institutions to say, hey, this is, it's all connected. It's all our work. What's the reception been like at your school amongst the administration and your staff? Like, have you gotten any feedback from your colleagues and peers? Yeah, I, um, I have yet to, in a very forward facing way, show it to everybody, but I've alluded to it and we've done a few, um, shout outs on our media pages. But, um, from what I've received so far, it's just, the utmost support. We really are trying to actively change our culture and um, I mean not change, preserve the things that we feel are dear and true to what it is that we teach, but alter our art with the changing world. And so I have just received, I'm so happy and grateful that people seem really excited about this work at UW Madison, because there was a fear of, oh, we have a university school of music. Could there be pushback because I'm not putting out a trumpet album with the stock standards. And they've been so excited for me and supportive. And I, I'm so grateful for the community that I'm in. That's really cool. and. 
in so many ways, this this is just it's the new frontier, and it's it's great to see the university embracing that and supporting it financially. And then, I don't know, I'm just I'm so excited to like see you or get maybe get to be a part of the live show doing it there um you know we'll see how that project evolves and, and finds its new life after the original of you know late 2019 coming through this album creation process the film release in 2021 was it only this year that we released the film yep yeah i think the first showing was like in january right through the friends of chamber music troy yeah yeah cool um so that brings us to the most recent release which was last week's release on September 25th of the album Descended um, that is being supported by Bright Shiny Things as the record label being produced around. We've got links for where you can buy the album, where you can download it. Um, I think for a lot of us, at least uh, John Escobar, who's the recording artist, a wonderful recording artist here in Boston, teaches at Berkeley and does a lot of the recording stuff for uh, From the Top. He he and I both kind of agree. It's like that, that is one of the projects of 2020, the thing that marks the pandemic for us. We all gathered Gene Fluent from Wisconsin. We were taking all sorts of like COVID test precautions, figuring out how to make it work. And just for a week, we gathered in John's house, moved all the furniture out of his living room. I set up drums with like towels and blankets on stands behind to create a, an augmented sound space that wasn't super reverberant. Maria had her marimba set up in the living room as well. We had the basement set up as like a sub studio space. Uh, we just spent a week recording this album and you heard you've, you've been hearing bits of that music in these various clips um, one of the brilliant things that i think that came of it just kind of still staying in the film world is how maria took that album content and completely remixed it for the film uh, like i was saying earlier it's it's all this whole project descended is all connected by this mycological layer of lafcadia hearn's stories and work um, but every tree is distinct in it. The album is a completely different project than the film, which would be completely different than the theatrical piece. And within the film, you'll hear these elements of the album, but even in the trailer there, that's a combination of at least two different tracks. The toy piano stuff and the drums that I was playing are like, those are not, those were not recorded together as the same thing, but it works. And it's a matter of playing this puzzle game. And at some point we'll be able to have Maria on a stream because uh, her creative process is just off the wall, brilliant, all the time. Um, and we'll get to talk to her about that. But uh, Jean, was there anything that like stands out to you from the album creation process, the recording of it? Yeah, well, there's the, the trope of, all right, we have this hurdle, how do we deal with it? You know, ideally we would have been in a studio playing music together. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I had never met Greg. We so the first time we <laughs> I played together, and it was just felt it was just great. And so I think, um, just goes back to speaking highly about Maria Finkelmeyer in just whatever situation you have, whether it's a nice studio or a living room with down blankets and new people. Um, the, your asset are the humans, and so we had this amazing vibe during that week and we had so much fun and it was a strong click during a, what could have been a really stressful week preparing an album and, and playing it with new people for the first time because we literally didn't have the option to rehearse because of the, the pandemic and we didn't have the option to play together because of the pandemic um but it, i think the the energy and the focus and the vibe was really really good and from what i know about my favorite albums in in history that that is a sort of a must for uh, to, to create something that resonates with other people is like the, the natural organic resonance within the artists themselves. And so that's what I mostly remember about the album. Yeah, it was it was super cool. Like for most of that week, I was just sitting alone behind the drums upstairs in the living room with my mask on. There was no one around. Everyone was in the basement, in the studio, like in the, in the recording room. Um, but I never felt disconnected from the project. And the handful of moments that we were able to be in the same place um, the album has some really beautifully crafted improvisatory work in it where the structures are in place for us to explore soundscapes and make things together that are emotive and evocative and immediate um stuff that we were doing with like uh melodica accordion trumpet voice and doing some voice sounds together just some of these um sort of extra textures of like we all had a jumble of bells or seed pods and just like crumpling stuff and trying to feel the moment there were these great moments of just like connection and intuitive playing that was really fun and a really 
uh, it just felt so easy to support, even with all the restrictions and challenges of recording in a pandemic. Um, I'm going to invite Neil to jump on because I kind of, uh, he hasn't been in the conversation yet, but I, I sprung the album on him on our way back from a gig on the 25th. We were up in New Hampshire and on the drive back, I was like, hey, uh, we just did this thing. I'm heading to the release party. Do you want to listen to it? So, um, Neil, you had some really wonderful insights and reactions to your first listen. Would you be willing to share a little bit of that? Of just like what, how the project, hearing the album first, not knowing about the art film, not knowing about with Katie O'Hearn's stories or seeing any of the theatrical work, like what were some of your first impressions of, of what this thing is? Yeah, I mean, certainly uh, listening to it in the car from a CD, just like, I don't know, it, it's perhaps an imperfect impression. And yet all we have these days are the imperfect impressions of whatever is the ideal. And what's great about this project is that, you know, Again, like no one iteration of the project is the whole picture. You're not ever going to get the whole thing. So we, we have the world building that goes into the album, the world building that goes into the film, the world building that uh, has gone into a version of a staged production and may play out further in, in the future, um, but all part of this like multiverse. <laughs> and it was, it, it seemed pretty clear to me within the context of that album that like, there is a narrative. I don't need to know what it is to hear that there's something, there's something happening underneath. And what really struck me was how much came out of so few people playing so of course, you know, there is the potential to orchestrate this entire thing and have 90 people on stage creating all the sounds to create this multiverse. And yet this was created by just a few people, a few multi-dimensional uh, musicians, performers who bring more than just one character or one genre or one skill to play. So actually I have a question for Eugene about that since you, are uh, playing trumpet and singing and um, involved in certainly the the direction of the, the film. Um, but like even while you're playing trumpet, there are just a lot of different colors and a lot of different approaches to trumpet playing, to brass playing, um, as well as vocally, like it's not just one one kind of approach. And I wonder how much of that you're cognizant of the different characters you're playing, the different characters within this world. And um, yeah, like, do you have a, a different approach to singing than you have to trumpet playing, um, at least within the context of this piece? Yeah, what are your thoughts about that, the different characters? Great question. Um, I, as you know, I, brass, our wheelhouse, is the fact that we can work with so many colors like percussion you know we the dexterity of a, of a woodwind player is there and then and also a string player and pianists pianists can produce all the harmonies and string players have double stops and you know other than multiphonics i have my one sound but even within a single crescendo on a single pitch you shift colors because of the way, the physics of the instrument so i always am thinking about colors um, in the sound and in my interpretation of the characters was that um, because uh, brass playing is so vocal instead of vibrating here you're vibrating here but the whole mechanism of support and sound production is basically the same um, it I feel like it's like this non-verbal voice so sort of the spirit or the essence of Lafcadio Hearn's lineage inside of me and also his writing that's inspired me as a, a creator um, was embedded into the trumpet sound because he's not verbally coming out of me, but he is sonically coming out of me in, in a very vocal way. Um, and then in terms of singing, in terms of like sound production in song or voice versus trumpet, I approach them very similarly and actually one informs the other as I get a higher range on the voice, my trumpet range increases as well, like to the half step. So I don't think that's, um, a coincidence at all, but I just use the voice as a way to add what we have in voices, uh, more diction and of course the meaning behind the text. And so trying to 
really use the color expansion and the narrative of like the voice is me and I'm maybe a character, like I'm singing Mujina's perspective or I'm singing my perspective or I'm singing a lullaby uh, to a child. I'm a character, a real physical human character. And then the trumpet playing is like the spiritual character that, that goes beyond the individual characters of each um, vocal part. Yeah, yeah, that that's really fascinating. And these different characters, of course, they're part of a world that um, Lafcadio O'Hearn uh, investigated that was part of this, you know, much larger ecosystem of stories and of, you know, just thoughts about like, what is life? <laughs> what happens later? How do we reflect back? on ourselves through this uh, investigation of the spirit world. Um, I wonder, you know, because this project is connected to you, you are in part the legacy of this, this family member who was also doing work in the public sphere. Like um, what, what has working on this project sort of revealed about you? Have you made some personal discoveries in the process of making public this other work that is so intertwined with the public and private and artistic and cultural. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes. The answer is yes. Um, I think what I love about Lafcadio O'Hearn's work uh, and what I glean from it is the fear experience and the beauty inside of it. I'm also, I've been transitioning a lot in my life lately with a big move from Boston where I met Maria um into a totally new job and then a new lifestyle a lot of new and that came with a lot of fear and then also being a musician and a performer in general comes in with a lot of fear and as i get older i realize how that f fear is one of two things it's this either a, a valid legitimate warning signal from your body or it's something to breathe and flow through and work past as long as and identifying the different versions of and flavors of fear is what I really connect to about Love Cardio and about this work um, and learning how to find what like my principal values are and uh, looking, looking towards those values usually there's a lot of layers and shades of fear in between and learning to like transcend through all of the fear in order if it's pointing you towards your values now if it's pointing you to a legitimate concern that's a different thing and so um i think like of, of like the haunting nature of lovecadio's work as helping identify the beauty and the awfulness and the awesomeness inside of the fear experience um there's more I could say, but I think I'll stop there. <laughs> that's that's fabulous. Thank you for sharing that. I think um, we're getting towards the end of the time. I know I want to. I know you've got stuff to get to, Gene. Um, but I want to just play a little bit of the album. Uh, I had a plan, but I'm going to change it because we touched on a few really neat things about like the colors of Trump playing the voice and the layers in the album. So the first little bit I'm going to play, and this is just audio, so we'll all just stay on stream, screen and listen, um, hopefully not too awkwardly to what's happening. Um, the first I'm gonna play is from Orbs. This track starts with uh, layered and looped bowed marimba sounds. And then this is one of those ones where we were able to collaboratively play and explore together in the basement studio with trumpet, free reed instruments, the melodica accordion, um, and, and really put in some of these beautiful layers. This is a little bit of Orbs of ghostliness.
gonna let this go in the background for a smidge, um, but one of the, the magic bits of recording this was getting to be in the same space and feel out where we are. We did a handful of takes, not a ton on this, because it was all about trying to capture a, a specific moment where we had this marimba loop that we had created um, we had some of these other textures that Maria put in later, but then it was really the two of you responding and listening to each other off of this um, fairly simple phrase, but how do you shape it? How do you make the colors? And I, I really like that in the album as a, as a softer moment in the flow. Um, do, you re do you remember anything about the recording takes of this or like what it felt like? Yeah, I think what I love about this piece and the recording of it and then the performing of it is it'll never be the same. And that is true for many of the pieces on the album. Um, but it is, it's a, a sonic conversation that's happening and it's just so ethereal and beautiful. Um, and I just, it was one of those moments where we had together where there was a combination of, there's a serious focus into the music when we were performing it and then when we stopped recording there were jokes you know you know and, and just the whole life experience felt to like weave its way into the way we recorded this and it's like let's try this let's try this i don't know oh my gosh gene go up the stairs and, and play your trumpet in the stairwell and see um see if you we can get you in a distant energy from the basement you know <laughs> and so it was just a combination of fun beautiful spiritual and all of the like. Yeah, it, it was it was great, uh, and it was it was so fun to, to hear you and, and see you experiencing that. Um, since we talked about the idea of like the trumpet and the voice, I'm going to grab another little clip. Uh, this is going to be from Muses, and I just need to make sure I can jump to the right spot quickly um, because we hear a transition from the the marimba uh, really groovy thing, which is like totally a hallmark of Maria's music. She writes with such groove and patterning. Um, that has this then trumpet line over it and then it goes into the voice and we can hear a little bit of that shift and exploration. So here's a little bit of Muses. Like I always said, talk over it, and then I just got too excited by hearing all the colors in your voice because it's so compelling. Um, get the album or listen to it. It's on many streaming services. It's on Deezer and Spotify and Apple Music. Uh, we've got links for it up. You can buy it from Bright Shiny Things directly. You can, you can buy it from your favorite source to buy things. You can buy a physical album. They're lovely. It's a beautiful cover and some work around it. Um, but it's just, it's so great hearing this project, being a part of it, and and understanding the breadth and size of its life and where it's going to go. Um, Gene, is there anything else you want us to like play or talk about? We'll kind of, we'll wrap it up here. We don't have to rush away, but um, 
it's been fun sharing so many different sides of this and, and you know like we we love that in the fourth loss just like it's our jam so it's so cool to, to be able to share this expression this new hybrid art form uh shape-shifting art project but is there anything you want to like wrap us up on or you want to say goodbye and say like hey get the stuff keep your eyes out <laughs> um i i do i think i want to highlight a few peripheral places to go um and people to highlight just because um lafcadio O'Hearn is being featured in a lot of ways in the world right now um and so that piece that you just heard muses was loosely inspired by a novel written by Mon Monique Truong and it was called The Sweetest Fruits and it's all about Lafcadio Hearn's life through the perspective of three core women in his life his two wives and his mother um and I actually really love the story and narrative of women the, the women in his life and how little we know about them especially his first wife Alethea was she was born to slavery and then they got married and he was fired from all of his jobs because at the time in 1870 I believe it was illegal to marry outside of your you know what they called race and so um uh this there's a fascinating narratives there and so go check out Monique Truong's book it's beautiful um and then also I haven't shared this publicly yet but the significance of the box in the film it's actually from a, a Japanese folk and ghost story called Urashima. Um, and it's, I'm not gonna say more, U-R-A-S-H-I-M-A. -A. Um, if you check it out, I think a lot of things will click about the film, but watch the film first, react, and then read Ur Urashima and then watch the film again. And we'll put some of those links we we're just doing i think neil and i are both doing frantic googling of trying to, to connect that because um it's not just for you dear viewers and watchers we do these streams for us it's they're often self-serving because like i want to look these things up and th now i can go back in the comments in the chat and find these links um because i'm excited to to learn about them um is it uh umushima taro is that probably right gene yeah yeah great I found the Wikipedia of it, so we can at least yeah. start there. <laughs> and um, yeah, I, one of the cool things, like as we've been talking more about creative process on Saturday Showtimes is bringing in our friends who have distinct and different approaches and inspirations. And it's been so fun talking to you today about yours and this project and, and where it comes from and, and where it's going. Um, I think the theatrical production of it, hopefully we're looking at, is it spring or fall of 22? We're looking at producing it and workshopping it in the spring and uh, make, bringing it to a new level, what currently exists to a new level, and then taking it on the road as soon as we can. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So uh, as we often say, everyone, please stay healthy, stay safe, get yourself your protections as you can, keep loving yourself and each other. Um, this is we're gonna, we're gonna wrap it up here uh check out the album it's called descended you can find the work on gene lawrence's website you can find it on mf dynamics website that's maria's website bright shiny things check out the art film by 410 media um so many great ways to engage with this work and you can just be in touch reach out to artists if you're watching this reach out to gene reach out to maria and just say hey i saw your thing it was super cool i want to see it more um, how can i produce it in my area those of you in the Chicago area, maybe who might be watching this, Neil's relatives who would be into the film. FYI, <laughs> Spencer, <laughs> just <laughs> calling it out directly. Uh, <laughs> look, we know who, we know our audience. <laughs> so uh, thank you all so much. We're gonna end the stream here. Check out these albums, check out Descended. Gene, thank you so much for joining us. Um, everyone have a great month. We'll see you in November.